हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम राज डॉक्टर राजीव जैन फ्रॉम जिवाजी यूनिवर्सिटी ग्वालियर टुडे आई शैल डिस्कस इन दिस मॉड्यूल एटॉमिक एब्जॉर्बशन स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी अंडर द पेपर फंडामेंटल्स ऑफ एनालिटिकल केमिस्ट्री इन एटॉमिक एब्जॉर्बशन स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी एज इज क्लियर फ्रॉम द नेम इट इज़ द एब्जॉर्बशन बाई एटम्स इन केस ऑफ मॉलिक्यूल्स मॉलिकुलर एब्जॉर्बशन स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी यू कैन डायरेक्टली स्टडी द एब्जॉर्बशन ऑफ इलेक्ट्रोमैग्नेटिक रेडिएशन बाई द मॉलिक्यूल्स बट एज द नेम एम्प्लाइज हीयर इट इज द एब्जॉर्बशन बाई एटम्स सो फर्स्ट थिंग इज हीयर एटोमाइजेशन दैट इज यू हैव टू कन्वर्ट मॉलिक्यूल इन टू एटम तो इन मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट डिफरेंस बिटवीन स्पेक्ट्रो फोटोमीटर फॉर एटोमिक एब्जॉर्बशन एंड वन फॉर मॉलिकुलर एब्जॉर्बशन इज द नीड टू कन्वर्ट एन ए लाइट इन टू फ्री एटम्स एटोमाइजेशन में भी कैरीड आउट बाई फ्लेम एटोमाइजेशन एंड बाई इलेक्ट्रोथर्मल एटोमाइजेशन मीन्स वी आर कन्वर्टिंग मॉलिक्यूल्स इन गैसियस फेस इन टू एटम्स and these atoms will absorb electromagnetic radiation and then we will study how absorption what changes take place by absorption of electromagnetic radiations by atoms if it is not possible to atomize by flame or by electrothermal atomization then there are various other methods for doing atomization of means atom atomization means conversion of molecules into atoms the objectives of this module in this module you will learn instrumentation of atomic absorption spectroscopy and in this instrumentation the difference with molecular spectroscopy is that here are it also involve uh, atomization and that can be carried out by flame atom atomizers or it can be carried out by electrochemical atomizers or various other methods are there then preparation of sample then important thing is here to study chemical interferences to remove chemical interferences because if some impurities are there then they interfere in the analysis then how to study of chemical interference so students you have seen there are two different type methods for atomization of molecules into atom it may be flame atomization or it may be electrothermal atomization so which type of atomization which technique of atomization should be used it depends upon the concentration of the analyte present in the matrix so how to select it if the concentration is very less then electrothermal Uh, atomization technique is usually selected but there is a limitation of electrothermal atomization that it there may be some interference in may be there and if the concentration is sufficient then flame uh, flame uh, atomization is preferred because in that case there are lesser chances of interferences and uh, it also gives a precision of results so if we compare both the methods then we can say that electrothermal atomization is more sensitive whereas flame atomization is less sensitive and for many substances where flame atomization is not possible electrothermal atomization can be carried out very easily flame atomizers in flame atomization the sample is first converted into a fine mist consisting of small droplets of solution as shown in figure 1 this is accomplished using a nebulizer assembly shown in figure 2 the sample is aspirated into a spray chamber by passing a high pressure stream consisting of one or more combustion gases past the end of a capillary tube immersed in the sample the impact of the sample with the glass impact bead produces an aerosol mist the aerosol mixes with the combustion gases in the spray chamber before passing to the burner 
where the flame is thermal energy dissolves the aerosol mist to a dry aerosol of a small solid particles subsequently thermal energy volatilizes the particles producing a vapor consisting of molecular species ionic species and free atoms in thermal energy in flame atomization is provided by the combustion of a fuel oxidant mixture common fuels and oxidants and their normal temperature ranges are listed in table 1 of these the air acetylene and nitrous oxide acetylene flames are used most frequently normally the fuel and oxidant are mixed in an approximately stoichiometric ratio however a rich fuel mixture may be desirable for atoms that are easily oxidized the most common design for the burner is the slot burner as shown in figure 3 this burner provides a long path length for monitoring absorbance and a stable flame the burner is mounted on an adjustable stage that allows the entire burner assembly to move horizontally and vertically horizontal adjustment is necessary to ensure that the flame is aligned with the instrument's optical path vertical adjustments are needed to adjust the height within the flame from which absorbance is monitored this is important because two competing processes affect the concentration of free atoms in the flame and increased residence time in the flame results in a greater atomization efficiency thus the production of free atoms increases with height on the other hand longer residence times may lead to the formation of metal oxide that absorb at a wavelength different from that of the atom for easily oxidized metals such as chromium the concentration of free atoms is greatest just above the burner head for metals such as silver which are difficult to oxidize the concentration of free atoms increases steadily with height other atoms show concentration profiles that maximize at a characteristic height the most common means for introducing samples into flame atomizer is continuous aspiration in which the sample is continuously passed through the burner while monitoring the absorbance continuous aspiration is sample intensive typically requiring 2 to 5 ml of sample flame micro sampling provides a means for introducing a discrete sample of fixed volume and is useful when the volume of sample is limited or when the sample's matrix is incompatible with the flame atomizer for example the continuous aspiration of sample containing a high concentration of dissolved solids such as sea water may result in the build up of solid deposits on the burner head these deposits partially obstruct the flame lowering the absorbance flame micro sampling is accomplished using a micro pipette to place 50 to 250 ml of sample in a teflon funnel connected to the nebulizer or by dipping the nebulizer tubing into the sample for a short time dip sampling is usually accomplished with an automatic sampler the signal for flame micro sampling is a transitory peak whose height or area is proportional to the amount of analyte that is injected the principal advantage of flame atomization is the reproducibility with which the sample is introduced into the spectrophotometer a significant disadvantage to flame atomizers is that the efficiency of atomization may be quite poor this may occur for two reasons first the majority of the aerosol mist produced during nebulization consists of droplets that are too large to be carried to the flame by the combustion gases consequently as much as 95% of the sample never reaches the flame 
a second reason for poor atomization efficiency is that the large volume of combustion gases significantly dilutes the sample. Together, these contributions to the efficiency of atomization reduce sensitivity since the analyte's concentration in the flame may be only 2.5 into 10 raised to power 6 of that in solution. Another type of atomizers are electrothermal atomizers. A significant improvement in sensitivity is achieved by using resistive heating in place of a flame. A typical electrochemical atomizer has been shown in figure, also known as graphite furnace, consists of a cylindrical graphite tube approximately 1 to 3 cm in length and 3 to 8 mm in diameter. The graphite tube is housed in an assembly that seals the ends of the tube with optically transparent windows. The assembly also allows for the passage of a continuous stream of inert gas, protecting the graphite tube from oxidation and removing the gaseous product produced during atomization. A power supply is used to pass a current through the graphite tube, resulting in resistive heating. Samples between 5 and 50 ml are injected into the graphite tube through a small diameter hole located at the top of the tube. Atomization is achieved in three stages. In the first stage, the sample is dries using a current that raises the temperature of the graphite tube to about 110 degrees centigrade. This solvation leaves the sample as a solid residue. In the second stage, which is called ashing, the temperature is increased to 350 to 1200 degrees centigrade. At these temperatures, any organic material in the sample is converted to carbon dioxide and H2O and volatile inorganic materials are vaporized. These gases are removed by the inert gas flow. In the final stage, the sample is atomized by rapidly increasing the temperature to 2000 to 3000 degrees centigrade. The result is a transient absorbance peak whose height or area is proportional to the absolute amount of analyte injected into the graphite tube. The three stages are complete in approximately 45 to 90 seconds, with most of this time used for drying and etching the sample. Electrothermal atomization provides a significant improvement in sensitivity by trapping the gaseous analyte in the small volume of the graphite tube. The analyte's concentration in the resulting vapor phase may be as much as 1000 times greater than that produced by flame atomization. The improvements in sensitivity and the resulting improvement in detection limits is offset by a significant decrease in precision. Atomization efficiency is strongly influenced by samples contact with the graphite tube, which is difficult to control reproducibility. Atomic absorption spectroscopy is very well suited for trace and ultra trace analysis by using electrothermal atomization. By diluting samples, atomic absorption spectroscopy can be applied to minor and major analytes. A small volume allows use of micro and ultra micro samples. That is, in atomic abduction spectroscopy, a analysis can be carried out to the level of parts per million or even less when using flame atomization process as well as when using electrothermal atomization process. With non-linear calibration curve, when we are using, it is non-linear Higher accuracy is obtained by using pair of standards whose absorbance closely bracket samples absorbance. So if standards are available as we took hollow cathode lamp by taking different types of standards, so far more than 60 elements have been analyzed by using atomic absorption spectroscopic. Determinate errors for electrothermal atomization are frequently greater than that obtained with flame atomization 
due to serious metric interferences. In case of, as we have all, already studied, I, have, I told you that in case of electrothermal atomization, the errors are there, the interferences are there, whereas in flame atomization, errors are less. So, if concentration is sufficient, then flame atomization is preferred, otherwise it is electrothermal atomization is preferred and by using electrothermal atomization, the liter, this technique is very sensitive and we can go up to uh, parts per tri trillion level and more than 60 elements have been analyzed so far. The source for atomic absorption is a hollow cathode lamp consisting of a cathode and anode enclosed within a glass tube filled with a low pressure of neon or argon gas as shown in figure 5. When a potential is applied across the electrode, the filler gas is ionized. The positively charged ions collide with the negatively charged cathode, dislodging or sputtering atoms from the cathode surface. Some of the sputtered atoms are in the excited state and emit radiation characteristic of the metal from which the cathode was manufactured. By fashioning the cathode from the metallic analyte, a hollow cathode lamp provides emission lines that correspond to the analyte's absorption spectrum. The sensitivity of an atomic absorption line is often described by its characteristic concentration, which is the concentration of analyte giving an absorbance of 0 0.00436 corresponding to a percent transmittance of 99%. Usually, the wavelength providing the best sensitivity is used, although a less sensitive wavelength may be more appropriate for a higher concentration of the analyte. A less sensitive wavelength also may be appropriate when significant interferences occur at the most sensitive wavelength. For example, atomizing a sample produces atoms of not only the analyte, but also of other components present in the sample's matrix. The presence of other atoms in the flame does not result in interference unless the absorbance lines for the analyte and the potential interference are within approximately 0.0, .0 nanometer. When this is a problem, interferences may be avoided by selecting another wavelength at which the analyte but not the interference absorbs. The emission spectrum from a hollow cathode lamp includes, besides emission lines for the analyte, additional lines for impurities present in the metallic cathode and the filler gas. These additional lines serve as a potential source of stray radiation that may lead to an instrumental deviation from Beer's law. Normally, the monochromator slit width is set as wide as possible, improving the throughput of radiation while being narrow enough to eliminate this source of stray radiation. Next important thing, a very important thing in this analysis is the preparation of the sample. Flame and electrothermal atomization require that the sample be in a liquid or solution form. Samples in solid forms are prepared for analysis by dissolving in an appropriate solvent. When the sample is not soluble, it may be digested either on a hot plate or by microwave using nitric acid, sulfuric acid or perfluoric acid. Alternatively, the analyte may be extracted via soxalate extraction. Liquid samples may be analyzed directly or may be diluted or extracted if the matrix is incompatible with the method of atomization. Serum samples, for instance, may be difficult to aspirate when using flame atomization and may produce unacceptably high background absorbances when using electrothermal atomization. 
a liquid liquid extraction using an organic solvent containing a chelating agent is frequently used to concentrate analyte dilute solutions of cadmium cobalt copper iron lead nickel and zinc ions for example can be concentrated by extracting with the solution of ammonium pyrrolidine dithiocarbamate in methyl isobutyl ketone minimizing spectral interference a spectral interference occurs when an analyte absorption line overlaps with an interference absorption line or band as noted earlier the overlap of two atomic absorption lines is seldom a problem on the other hand a molecules broad absorption band or the scattering of source radiation is potentially serious spectral interference an important question to consider when using a flame as an atomization source is how to correct for the absorption of radiation by the flame the products of combustion consists of molecular species that may exhibit broad band absorption as well as particulate material that may scatter radiation from the source if this spectral interference is not corrected then the intensity of the transmitted radiation decreases the result is an apparent increase in the sample's absorbance fortunately absorption and scattering of radiation by the flame are corrected by analyzing a blank spectral interference is also occur when components of the sample's matrix react in the flame to form molecular species such as oxides and hydroxide absorption and scattering due to components in the sample matrix other than the analyte constitute the sample's background and may present a significant problem particularly at wavelengths below 300 nm at which the scattering of radiation becomes more important if the composition of the sample's matrix is known then standards can be prepared with an identical matrix in this case the background of absorption is is the same for both the samples and standard alternatively if the background is due to a known matrix component then that component can be added in axis to all samples and standard so that the contribution of the naturally occurring interference is insignificant finally much interference due to the sample's matrix can be eliminated by adjusting the flame's composition for example by switching to a higher temperature flame it may be possible to prevent the formation of interfering oxides and hydroxides when the identity of the matrix interference is unknown or when it is impossible to adjust the flame to eliminate the interference then other means may be used to compensate for the background interference several methods have been developed to compensate for matrix interferences and most atomic absorption spectrophotometers include one or more of these methods one of the most common methods for background correction is the use of continuum source such as a d2 lamp since the d2 lamp is a continuum source the absorbance of its radiation by the analyte's narrow absorption line is negligible any absorbance of radiation from the d2 lamp therefore is due to the background absorbance of radiation from the hollow cathode lamp however is due to both the analyte and the background subtracting the absorbance for the d2 lamp from that for the hollow cathode lamp gives an absorbance that has been corrected for the background interference although this method of background correction may be quite effective it assumes that the background absorbance is constant over the range of wavelengths passed by the monochromator when this is untrue subtracting the two absorbances may under or over correct for the background other methods of background correction have been developed including zeeman effect background correction and smith high field background correction both of which are included in some commercially available 
atomic absorption is possible. Another thing is to minimize chemical interferences. The quantitative analysis of some elements is complicated by chemical interferences occurring during atomization. So the two most common chemical interferences are the formation of non-volatile compounds containing the analyte and ionization of the analyte. One example of chemical interference due to the formation of non-volatile compounds is observed when phosphate or aluminum ion is added to solution of calcium ion. In one study, for example, adding 100 ppm aluminum ion to a solution of 5 ppm calcium ion decreased the calcium ion's absorbance from 0.50 to 0.14, whereas adding 500 ppm potassium phosphate ion to a similar solution of calcium ion decreased the absorbance from 0.50 to 0.38. These interferences were attributed to the formation of refractory particles of calcium phosphate and aluminum calcium oxide. The formation of non-volatile compounds often can be minimized by increasing the temperature of the flame, either by changing the fuel to oxidant ratio or by switching to a different combination of fuel and oxidant. Another approach is to add a releasing agent or protecting agent to solutions containing the analyte. A releasing agent is a species whose reaction with the interference is more favorable than that of the analyte. Adding strontium ion or lanthanum to solutions of calcium ion, for example, minimizes the effect of phosphate ion and aluminum ion by reacting in place of the analyte. Adding 2000 ppm of strontium chloride to the calcium phosphate and calcium aluminate mixture discussed above gave absorbances for each of 0.48, whereas a solution of 2000 ppm strontium chloride and calcium ion alone gave an absorbance of 0.49. Protecting agents react with the analyte to form a stable volatile complex. Adding 1% volume weight by weight EDTA to the calcium phosphate solution discussed in the preceding paragraph gave an absorbance of 0.52 compared with an absorbance of 0.55 for just the calcium ion and EDTA. On the other hand, EDTA does not serve as a protecting agent for solutions of calcium and aluminum ions. Ionization interferences occur when thermal energy from the flame or electrothermal atomizer is sufficient to ionize the analyte. That is, M is ionized to M plus ion and electrons are ejected, where M is the analyte in atomic form and M ion is the cation of the analyte formed by ionization. Since absorption spectra for M and M plus are different, the position of the equilibrium in the reaction one affects absorbance at wavelength where M absorbs. If another species is present that ionizes more easily than M, then the equilibrium in reaction 1 shifts to the left. Variations in the concentration of easily ionized species therefore may have a significant effect on a sample's absorbance resulting in a determinate error. The effect of ionization can be minimized by adding a high concentration of an ionization suppressor, which is simply another species that ionizes more easily than the analyte. If the concentration of ionization suppressor is sufficient, then the increased concentration of electrons in the flame pushes reaction 1 to the left, preventing the analyte's ionization. Potassium and cesium are frequently used as ionization suppressors because of their low ionization energy. Another important thing associated with atomic absorption spectroscopy is that the, its selectivity is very high. Why its selectivity is very high? Because we obtain, we here get narrow widths of absorption lines. 
narrow width of absorption lines we obtain in atomic absorption spectroscopy due to which it, this technique is highly selective. Whereas in molecular spectroscopy, we get bands, we get bands which are broad. So the selectivity may be less, the absorption in case of molecules which are having closer uh, lambda backs or closer values, they may uh, superimpose each other. So the uh, selectivity may be not much higher. But in case of atomic absorption spectroscopy, it is the narrow width of absorption lines. Lines, we get absorption lines which is of very narrow width. So this uh, technique gives very high selectivity and due to this reason, uh, we have studied so far over 60 elements. Uh, analysis time in flame automization is very less, whereas in electrothermal automization, time is more. Uh, by using a simple uh, flame atomization technique, in an hour, about 200 to 400 samples may be analyzed in an hour. Atomic absorption spectroscopy has been used for qualitative and quantitative analysis for a variety of elements in different types of matrices. Its specificity, selectivity and sensitivity is so high that it is a method of choice. For example, if I take a zinc, zinc element, it has been analyzed in so diverse fields starting from if we take from water to wastewater, in mi milk, in blood, in urine, in ores and alloys, in fats, in different types of requirements in fiber, in agriculture products. So by taking different types of matrices, we can put it or atomize it by using electrothermal atomization method or flame automization method and we can study it due to its line which we obtain a very sharp line. We can selectively by in a simple single experiment, we can qualitatively and quantitatively analyze lots of different types of uh, elements. So this is a method of choice. But we have to keep in mind that interferences sh should not be there. Either we use flame atomization or electrothermal uh, or automization. For, for example, if we take the determination of uh, different types of elements, zinc I want to determine, iron I want to determine, different uh, copper I want to determine, nickel. Then earlier we have to take a, for single determination a single hollow cathode lamp was required. But nowadays we have multi-element, multi-element hollow cathode lamp by taking a hollow cathode lamp various types, different elements can be determined and the math with selectivity and the sensitivity is very high and we can go less than parts per million. Thank you.